everyone. You know, back in April, mid-April, I did a video that I regrettably deleted. And I had people telling me that it was one of the best videos I ever did. And so we're going to circle back around and kind of retouch the topics from that video. It was about how we're living in the time of sorrows and all that. But I also want to kind of tie it into some other stuff. And I'm just going to say a quick prayer. Holy Spirit, I just ask, Lord, that you would lead my thoughts as I record and speak so that this is edifying, therapeutic even, for myself and for those listening. I request this in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth. Amen. So I don't know if you're going to get anything out of this or not. And, you know, I have those thoughts of, you know, who am I to say anything and... Quite often I have thoughts of, you know, the world doesn't need me to state the obvious kind of thing. But you know what? There's plenty of other people on YouTube who state the obvious and people don't mind. They, they seem to love it, <laughs> you know? So, I don't know. I just feel like coming on here and talking about this. And no, God did not tell me to do this. This is just me coming on here of my own volition. Um... So, I went to graduate school for a Master's of Science in Marriage and Family Therapy. And although I did not complete the program because some stuff happened, I did complete most of it, but the point is... Um, one of the very first classes that we took that first semester, the first courses that we took that sem that first semester, um, we learned about epistemology. Now that's a big word that most people don't know. And if you Google that word, it'll give you a really crappy definition. The marriage and family therapy program that I went to was very unique in that they very much really like hardcore taught about systems theory, second order cybernetics, etc. And again, this is stuff that most people have never even heard of. Um, but some of the basic concepts is that everything is connected, nothing exists um, in a vacuum. Everything affects everything else. Everything is in relationship to everything else. And relationship is just a pattern of interaction between two parties or two things. Even when you, you know, walk, like for example, right now I'm in this Airbnb and I'm on the second floor and when I walk around on the floor, it creaks. When I go up, up and down the stairs, it creaks. I have a relationship between me, there is a relationship between me and the wooden floor, the wooden stairs, okay, there's an effect, hence it's creaking, okay, so just, just in those, into that, like, in that intellectual kind of sense of the word, okay. One of the big words we learned was epistemology. Now, to put it in layman's terms, <sighs> epistemology like, we would talk about what is our or my epistemology. And what we meant by that in, in my program was, what is your worldview? That, that's, a, that's a more contemporary lingo kind of word. What is your worldview? Basically, what are the tenets that guide your, val like, it, 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 your, your value system? What are your values? What do you believe? Um, 
What assumptions do you automatically make that maybe you shouldn't be making or maybe you should, you know, whatever, right? And that was also part of what we learned as therapists in training was try your best to never make assumptions. And that is a really, it, that is wisdom to really live by. And, um, you know, we all do it. And so we were trained, we learned how to make distinctions between what is actually being discussed, the actual specific topic of what's being discussed. We learned how to make a distinction, how to distinguish between that specific topic and things that may be related to that, that maybe you could make an assumption and attach to that specific topic, but it's not necessarily you know, it, it's not that specific topic. And, you know, I made a recent example on here um, in my recent video talking about how, you know, if God references lyrics of a song, he's not, he's not necessarily referencing the people who wrote the song or performed the song. You know, he's just talking about the lyrics. So that, that, that's just an example. But I say all this to, pre to, to preface to give context, and that's something else I learned in my program. Um, one of the concepts is, you know, everything makes sense with context, and if it doesn't make sense, you don't have enough, you don't have enough context, and therefore you need to ask curious questions to procure, to obtain, to acquire more information. And there is stuff, for example, in the canon, in the Bible that doesn't make sense. But then when you go and you look at what is considered extra biblical text that the evil Catholic Church took out or ruled out or whatever, then you get more context. You get more information that then makes the stuff in the Bible make sense, right? And so because I'm isolated and I'm in... I, you know, I was talking to God today, as I do every day, and he's been talking more and more to me lately. Um, the Lord was telling me about how I have been in one very, very long season of wilderness, pretty much since my ex-husband and I parted ways. Back in 2009, I have been in a very long season of wilderness. And within that season, there has been chapters and I believe he told me today that I, I'm about to close the chapter that I'm in. And I said, okay, Lord, well, I'm just curious. What exactly would you label the chapter that I'm currently in that I'm about to close? And he said, testing. And I said, okay, that makes sense, you know. Um, but the point that I kind of want to get at is we are in the tribulation. Right now, I believe we are you know, in the third seal. I believe the fourth seal will be evident soon. And I believe that those things are like a crescendo. You know, once they start, they are, uh, they just, you know, keep happening and getting worse, you know, coming to, going up to the climax of Christ's return and whatever. And, um, and if you can't hear me, I'm sorry, but I am having to, um, I'm trying to be considerate of with my volume because I am in an Airbnb. Um, but uh, epistemology, you know, so we are in the tribulation. We are in the time of sorrows. And I've been kind of coming to realize that since on and off, since maybe 2013 or 14, maybe 2014, I think. Yeah. I was waking up in 2014 and then a bunch of traumatic stuff happened and I kind of fell back asleep a little bit. And then the Lord woke me back up again in 2016 and then some traumatic stuff happened and I kind of, you know, forgot about it again. And then the Lord woke me up a third time two years ago in 2020 and that's when it finally hit me like okay we are in the last days now you know um i wasn't sure if we were actually in the tribulation yet in 2020 i 
thought we might have been, but I, if we weren't, I knew that we were like right on the brink of it. And now I know that we are. And, you know, I've, I've done videos here and there over the last two years just touching on the concept of just, you know, coming to terms with this, processing it psychologically, grieving it, mourning it, um, how to cope with it, you know, all that. And I want to address how there's a dichotomy going on right now within myself, and maybe you can relate to this. I'm sure a lot of you can. Um, and, and if you don't know what a dichotomy means, it means where you have two things existing at the same time that seem to be opposite. And that was something else I learned in my marriage family therapy program off the bat was this concept of how the world teaches us, indoctrinates us to think in terms of either or, always putting everything in an in a either or um, paradigm, when in a lot of times, in a lot of cases, it's both and. And a, di a dichotomy is both and. It's not either or, it's both and. And what I've been kind of thinking about today and just recently is I have this dichotomy going on right now of at the same time I feel like I am more <sighs> convicted, more resolved, more fortified, more concrete in who I am, my identity in Christ, and all that than I ever have been in my entire life thus far, right? I have that, but at the same token, I feel also like I just need some more clarity, like there's a fog, like, and, and I think that's really just the, the trauma of processing that we are the last generation. We are in the tribulation. We are in the time of sorrows. We are at the beginning of the time of sorrows. And let me also kind of normalize and define what I mean by trauma. Again, a lot of people, when they hear the word trauma, they think of something very, very extreme, like a rape or murder or something like that. But trauma is a spectrum and it can be something very insignificant that, you know, and, and, and trauma can be different for different people as well, you know. Um, trauma is just really anything that just kind of catches you off guard and or just overwhelms you. Um, you don't know how to cope with it. You don't know how to process it. And so your brain is, you know, your, your mind is trying to grapple with it, you know. And um, I've just been kind of reflecting on how my epistemology has continuously evolved over the course of my life because i again i've been i've been in this this wilderness season um i've been very isolated and i've had all this time on my hands and so i've been doing a lot of reflecting on my life and just different seasons and chapters and things that have happened and you know what was my epistemology at each point in time? You know, how did I view the world? What did I believe? Um, what was I aware of? What was I not aware of? You know, um, what wisdom did I have at that point or not have at that point? You know, um, what insight did I have or not have? You know, all, all these things. What had I learned or not learned at that point in time? You know, and... It's, it's, it, isn't it just amazing how one can evolve like that? You know, if you look back five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, who were you and who are you now, you know? And um, this is a very, very unique time. And even scripture tells us that. It tells us that this time, this point in time, what what is what's what's happening, what will happen, that um, it's going to be unlike any other time.
And, and yeah, you know, just my epistemology has just, just in the last two years has so changed. You know, like the world's ending. Here we are. Here we are. There is no growing old peacefully rocking on your front porch rocking chair watching the sunset with, you know, just with no cares. That's all out the window, you know? If you're aware of where we're at, of what's going on, if you're in intimacy with the Lord, you know that things are just going to get worse until Christ returns. And so all that has had such a profound effect on my epistemology. My priorities my values, my standards. It, it's like night and day, you know? And I know, I know I'm just stating the obvious, but I've had people tell me that when I come on here and just kind of talk these things out, you know, that it's somewhat comforting to them or therapeutic for them because it makes them feel like they're not the only one going through it. And, you know, it can be somewhat therapeutic for me as well. So that's why I'm doing this. But yeah, um, when I realized where we were at two years ago, like <laughs> just certain things, you know, like, okay, like I, there was a ring, there was a very specific, well, not like in terms of like when I finally got married, I wanted an engagement ring, I wanted a diamond ring, I wanted this, that, and the other, you know, certain cut, certain style, blah, blah, blah. And two years ago, all that went out the window. All that went out the window. Now I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll put on a silicone groove ring and that that's good, you know? Like, total, like, 180. I miss New Jersey. I grew up in the Pine Barrens, the Pine Lands of New Jersey at the Jersey Shore. There's a unique ecosystem there. Um, I miss hearing the whippoorwills. Um, and there's just, it, it's just home to me and I miss it. Like I have been aching for New Jersey. I've been aching and I know I can't go back there. I know that I am done there and I'm pretty... I'm pretty confident that I'm probably never going to be there again before before the Lord returns. And I know that I can't go back there because I know that there's a tsunami coming. Because the Lord has shown me that in dreams. He's shown other people. It's established. We know this. I remember when I still lived in New Jersey when I was kind of going through the aftermath of my divorce, um, I was going out to the bar all the time. I got into the karaoke scene for a while, for a, for a chapter. Um, I have pictures of myself wearing belly shirts. I had a perm, you know, and that was back when I still looked good, you know. <laughs> um, and it's just like, oh my gosh, like look at how much I've changed. My whole world, my whole epistemology, my whole perspective and viewpoint, my whole everything has changed. I used to be a shot girl. I used to go to the bar and be a shot girl and, you know, um, just do all that worldly stuff, you know, and, uh, and look at me now. Now I've come to realize I'm a prophetess, I'm a teacher, I'm doing my best to serve the Lord and I've followed him so much to the point that he's got me depending on him and being homeless and like it's just it's a lot to take in now I know all of you aren't in the same exact boat as, as, as me obviously um but I know to, to one extent or another you all can relate that you know things have changed in the last two years this is no secret you know um but I don't know, I was just reflecting on this and I just thought I'd come on here and just kind of speak on it. Um, but yeah, like, entire epistemology. My, my, just every, 
how I think about everything has changed. I used to, yeah, you know, want a nice house and have nice things and all this and that. And now it's like, okay, after being homeless, I'm like, I would like a plot of land so I can grow some food and enough space to have my preps and, uh, you know, just like those, the bare necessities, you know, like, I remember back in 2016, I was making good money, I was working two jobs, I was making good money, and, um, I had my heart set on, like, buying these, um, these particular curtains, like, that was gonna be, like, my next thing, because I was really trying to, like, make my apartment into a home, um, and I thought that it was a kind of like a like a rite of passage of like becoming like a like a full grown adult is like having a nice home with nice things, you know. And and right at that point in time is when I lost my job, and everything just went downhill. And um, I almost became homeless during that section of time of my life. And um, and the Lord stripped me with within months. I was stripped of. Um, a lot of my nice things, you know, um, I had nice furniture and everything and I, I had to sell it and all this stuff. And, you know, it, I realize now looking back that it, this has been like a long process. This has been a long, slow process. And I didn't even realize what the Lord was doing while he was doing it years in advance. And now here I am homeless, doing ministry, the world's ending, and now my prayer is, Lord, I, I would just like to have enough space for my possessions, my preps, and it would be nice just to have a stable home. Never mind having fancy curtains, <laughs> you know? Like, just, yeah, epistemology. My epistemology has changed. Um... It, it's just, it's just amazing. It, and, and, and I still can't really fully wrap my mind around like, this is it. Like, this is it. We are the last generation. We are in the time of sorrows. And I think back in April, I had heard someone else on YouTube, uh, or no, they had, they had posted a, a community page post and they, they said something. I don't remember exactly what they said, but they said something about like living in fear or something like that in in terms in in regards to us being in the tribulation and I just want to hit on that again like do not allow anybody to come at you with that nonsense we need to accept reality we need to be aware and awake and accept reality and we are in the time of sorrows. And accepting that reality, that truth, is not living in fear. And the more that you grasp it now, the sooner you can grasp it now, the better. Because that will prepare you to cope with what's coming. It's the people who aren't grappling with this, haven't been grappling with it the last two years, and aren't grappling with it now... Those are the people who are just, they, like, when stuff really, really starts happening, they are going to lose their freaking minds. They are going to lose their minds. And I know even the people who've been trying to grapple with this over the last two years, we've had our moments where we thought we were losing our minds, you know, and, but when, but when, when, like, the extreme stuff really starts happening, whew, I don't have words to express, you know, I mean, people are really, really going to lose it. Because it's all going to hit them at once. It's not going to be some slow, gradual process. It's going to be everything all at once. <sighs> anyway. There's just... Things have just been becoming very, very clear-cut to me. And I've 
shared a lot of this before, like I said, but like the Lord has just been making it more and more clear of like who to associate with from who not to. And really the list of who not to is way, way bigger, way larger. And, um, and it's only going to keep getting larger. The more and more people that take the mark and whatever. And, um, so yeah, there's just, there's just this like dichotomy of like, there's so much clarity, but yet there's like the fog of trauma, you know, there's this like, on, on one hand, you have so much clarity, you have so much conviction and so much resolve of like, okay, Lord, I'm bracing and I'm coping as best I can. My soul belongs to you. My everything belongs to you. I'm dependent on you. I trust you. I have put my faith in you. My hope is in you. I'm going to stay loyal to you no matter what it takes. So there's like that clarity. I know who I am in Christ. I know my offices. I know my gifts. I know my purposes. You know, whatever. Um, but then on the other hand, at the same time, there's also just this massive uncertainty. Now, to some extent, that has always been because no one is God and no one knows the future. Sure, you can speculate and you can make predictions and whatever, and but really, you don't know. And even when the Lord gives you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, prophecy, whatever, dreams, visions, you still don't know exactly what's going to happen, when, how, where, you know, etc. And that is exasperated, exasperated, I I can't say that word. (laughs) If that is all exasperated, because we're in the tribulation. And so we know from scripture, and like I said, you know, we, we know from dreams, visions, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, prophecy, we have some outline of like, okay, the horrible things that are coming, but like we have no clue exactly how, when, where, and we know we've been realizing that like this stuff can sneak up on you out of nowhere. It can sneak up on you out of nowhere, whether it's within your personal domain or whether it's macro or whatever. It's both, really. I mean, and so I don't know. I just felt like coming on here and kind of talking about this, you know, just, yeah. Has your epistemology changed over the course of your life? I'm sure it has. Has your epistemology changed over the last two years? I'm sure it has. You know, have your values, your priorities, your perspective, you know, your... Epistemology is basically the lens that you see through. Just like when you're wearing glasses or something, you know, like, has your lens changed you know, like have this, have have scales fallen off of your eyes so that you see clearer, you know. If you're walking with the Lord, that should be what's happening. If you're in intimacy with the Lord, that should be an ongoing thing. Um, and that is the only evolution uh, that really is um, in alignment with Christianity, you know, is that if you're walking with the Lord in intimacy, then your epistemology should be evolving the longer you're alive because the Holy Spirit will be giving you more and more revelation of things and conviction of things and so yeah there's this dichotomy right now of just being so sure so confident so certain so resolved so convicted having such clarity regarding certain aspects of things but then at the same time there is just this massive, profound uncertainty. And it's a very fine line to walk between faith and doubt, between certainty and uncertainty, 
between clarity and fog, you know? I guess clarity and confusion. And yes, the Lord gives us a sound mind. Our mind is guarded in Christ Jesus, yada, yada. I, I'm aware of what scripture says, but I'm talking about just the experience of coping. Yes, the Lord does keep us grounded. He is our rock. But we, you know, it, it's good to acknowledge that there is a mixture of things going on internally. There is a dichotomy that goes on, you know. Um, and it's this process of just, um, yes, Holy Spirit, exactly. That verse from, uh, what is it, First Chronicles? That says, you know, we don't have the power, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you, Lord. That sums it up, doesn't it? That just sums it up. Lord, we acknowledge that we're powerless. We acknowledge that we don't know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you. And the only power that we could have comes through Christ in us and through us, right? Um, the only thing that, ca that we can be certain of is what scripture tells us and what, you know, basically the Logos word of God and the Rhema word of God. We know we're at the end. We know things are going to get worse. But we know that our God is our refuge, our strong tower, our provider and protector, our friend, our father. Holy Spirit reveals unsearchable things to us. And so... The only thing that we can do, the wisest thing that we can do, is to press in for more revelation. And lately, that's what the Lord has been doing with me. And I just mentioned that recently in a recent video. He's been having me wait on him. He's been having me listen. And he will tell me things that either I wasn't aware of or like wasn't sure of or he'll confirm something and I'll ask him okay do you want me to share this Lord and no he just he's just telling me things and that is what it is that's what we need that's what you need that's what we all need in our relationship with the Lord right now moving forward in the tribulation is that intimacy where the Lord just speaks to you where he calls you to quietness, he calls you to be still, he calls you to, he calls you to be quiet, he calls you to wait on him, he calls you to actively listen for his voice, and he will start telling you things. He's been telling me things about certain groups of people lately, um, just all kinds of stuff. And again, you know, I've asked him if I, if he wants me to share and he said, no, I'm just telling you. I'm like, okay, God, you know, um, he will reveal unsearchable things to you. I mean, yeah, again, we can all speculate and whatever, and we can have our theories, but then when the Lord just flat out tells you something, it's like, okay, I can put that to bed now. Got it. Thank you, Lord. He dimin yes, I'm hearing Holy Spirit say he diminishes the uncertainty. He diminishes the uncertainty. He is not the author of confusion. He diminishes the confusion. He conquers the confusion. He will speak to you so that the confusion is um, overcome, right? Through Christ, we are more than conquerors. We are overcomers. And the Lord told us to endure and persevere till the end. He told us that he is with us till the end. We need to be in intimate relationship with him. And again, what is the definition of relationship? It's a pattern of interaction between two parties. Are you speaking to the Lord? Are you telling him what you believe? what you think, what you feel, what you fear, what you desire. Are you waiting on him? Are you actively listening for his voice? Are you letting him just speak to you 
to give you instruction, to give you insight, to give you wisdom, to maybe correct you if you need it, to rebuke you if you need it, to maybe confirm or debunk any theories you have, etc. Are you seeking him for revelation and are you giving him the opportunity by being still and actively listening, are you giving him the opportunity to speak to you in the secret place, in your prayer closet? Because these are the things that will mold and shape and evolve your epistemology. And we need to have the epistemology of God. That is brilliant, Holy Spirit. Thank you. We need to have the epistemology of God. We need to have, we need to be wearing the lens, lenses of God. We need to see things through God's perspective, God's eyes. Brilliant, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Thank you. So that's a question that I exhort you to go into your prayer closet and ask the Lord and say, Lord, what is your epistemology? Will you please give me your epistemology? Will you please tell me what is the correct perception? What is the correct viewpoint? What is the correct way to, to perceive things? There's that scripture. I've been hearing people quote it since 2019. Um, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Blah, 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 right? Why do you think the Lord put that in scripture? Because your perception affects everything. Your epistemology, your perception affects everything. There's another channel, and I saw, I, I read one of the titles of this person's um, videos probably a month or two ago. And she was touching on a concept that we learned in my marriage and family therapy program about how the, um, the perceiver affects what it's perceiving, okay? Like there is some truth to that. Even when you are a therapist, right? You sit down as the therapist and you have a client, whether that's one person or a couple or a family, whatever. And yes, you can observe them and whatever, but like you are now part of that system. The therapist is not in a vacuum where they're, you know, like once the client sits down on, on the therapist's couch, so to speak, the client is not in a vacuum and the therapist is not in a vacuum. They affect each other. And most of communication is nonverbal, you know? So yeah, absolutely. There's such thing as, you know, having a good fit therapist or not a good fit therapist because the therapist does affect the client and the client does affect the therapist. And we need to comprehend this concept. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is wisdom that applies to everything in life. We need to ask God for his perception. We need to ask God how to perceive the world, how to perceive ourselves, how to perceive other people, how to perceive the relationship between one party and another party. And that's something that the Lord has been having me do a lot lately as well is basically asking him that asking him to give me the correct perception hence that's actually what was the catalyst for um, him speaking to me yesterday um, as to why I came on here and apologized he was giving me the correct perception of myself regarding my ministry and how I behave sometimes and whatever you know but it, it, so it, it can be something personal about yourself, but it can also be about other people. It can be about macro level stuff, just what's going on in the state, the country, the world. We need to ask the Lord if our epistemology is in alignment with his epistemology. If our perception is matching his perception. Are we comprehending things accurately? Are we judging things 
accurately. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That was brilliant. What did Jesus say? He said, take the plank out of your own eye so that you can see clearly, so that you can judge clearly. You can judge accurately. We're told in Malachi that we are to judge between the righteous and the wicked. And what I've come to realize is that that means that we are to accurately judge the distinction between who belongs to God and who doesn't, who's Nephilim and who isn't, who is barley um, instead of wheat, okay? I know I've taught on here about, you know, like using the analogy of like the outer court, inner court, holy of holies. But even in the holy of holies, this is what the Lord's been showing me over the last, what, six, seven months. Um, even within the holy of holies category, there's an even holier uh, group of people. And holy means set apart, okay? Um, you've got the wheat, but then you've got the barley. And the barley is those who are really, really consecrated, sanctified, set apart, really seeking the Lord to be 100% surrendered. They are meek. Jesus said that the meek will inherit the earth. Meek means to submit. They are the people who have really decided to 100% as best they know how submit to the Lord. And when you do that, it totally changes your epistemology. Totally changes it. Again, your, your values change regarding certain things. Your perspective changes. Your priorities change, etc. <clears throat> and again, that always applies, always has applied, but it applies especially now because we are in the tribulation. We are in the time of sorrows. <clears throat> and it's a gravely sobering reality. So yeah, don't let anybody tell you that you're living in fear or anything along those lines. Because we have to be of sober... Thank you, Holy Spirit. We have to be sober and vigilant. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Just like it says in Peter. Pretty sure it was Peter. We are to be of sober mind and vigilant. We are to set ourselves apart. <clears throat> and when you do that, it, it does. It just, it changes your, your, I mean, well, I guess your, it, it kind of goes back and forth. And that's something else that I learned in my marriage and family therapy uh, program they called it like a feedback loop and really all that means is just the relationship the pattern of interaction <clears throat> um in a way like it circles but like not in like um not in an irrational way it's a matter of like okay either there's a positive um thank you holy spirit escalation escalation is the way to put it right so, like, you can have a disagreement with someone and that can escalate, right? That, that would be a negative um, feedback loop or f feedback cycle. But if a man and a woman come together in the way that God ordained and designed and that dynamic is healthy, that's a positive feedback loop. The, the man initiates, the man pursues, the woman receives him graciously, and it just continues and continues. And... Um, Holy Spirit, please get me back on track. <clears throat> <clears throat> what was the point I was going to get back to, Lord? I lost my point, but... <clears throat> these are just things that just apply in life. And... Um, oh, right. That's what I was going to get at. Okay, so... You make the decision that you're going to lay down your life for Christ. You're going to make him priority. You're going to submit to him, even though you may not know what that looks like. You may not know what that really means yet, right? But that's the initial decision that you make. And then it creates this, um, like once you do that, and then you start 
acting that out and walking that out, then the the act of doing that, the act of going ahead and submitting to the Lord, <clears throat> it it um it then circles back to you making more decisions along the same lines and then you do it and you decide and you do it and you decide and you do it. So there's a decision and there's an action. Holy Spirit, you are just going on a, a wow. Okay, this ties in now to faith without works is dead. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Faith without works is dead. You make a decision to have faith. You make a decision to trust God, prioritize God, submit to God, surrender to God, and then you do what? You do something. There's a verb. There's an action. There's a work, right? You decide and you act. You decide and you act. And it's this feedback loop. <clears throat> and so that process, that feedback loop of decide and act in terms of submitting to the Lord, it sets you apart. It makes you holy. It consecrates you. It sanctifies you. And so you move from outer court to inner court to holy of holies, from wheat to barley. <clears throat> Thank you, Holy Spirit. A lot of the stuff I've said, I was not planning on saying this is Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, but it all it all makes sense. And so that's that's where I've been at, you know, and um I get a lot of people mocking me, falsely accusing me, yada yada yada, and you know, they're having a grand old time, but God's gonna have the last laugh because he knows that I am putting him first. I am meek. I am submitting to him. Look at John the Baptist, you know, living out in the woods, eating bugs. And what did Jesus say about John the Baptist? That he was the greatest. So being set apart, making a decision and then acting it out, making a decision and acting it out, that feedback loop, that process of being holy, of being set apart, it may not look or be fun. And people may mock you for it. Hence, it says in scripture that God uses the foolish things of the world. And really the way that that should be phrased um, in English language um, is what, like what the world considers foolish to um, confound the wise or those who see themselves as wise. But really, the truth is the exact opposite. This world is an inversion of the truth, of the reality. Those who really walk with the Lord in intimacy have wisdom, and it may look like they're living in the woods eating bugs. It may look like they're homeless living in hotels. It may look like they're homeless on the street. It may look like whatever that the world will scoff at and mock. Because this world is ruled by Satan. But the kingdom of God within you is the opposite. This world is an inversion. It's the opposite of the truth. It's the opposite. And there are people on both sides of that line. And the people on the side of the fence that are in the world, they're so confident of themselves that they know what's what. Those who have no intimacy with Jesus, with Yeshua, they are so confident that they know what's up. This is going to be a little off topic, but it also but it, it kind of ties in. So I saw a video today. There's a channel called Billy Speaks. It's a cat. It's a female cat that looks very similar to my tigress. Um, and she has buttons and she knows um, 
you know, words in the English language and, you know, and so it's, it's been kind of fascinating to watch this little cat. And this is a little thing that I watch. They're short little videos and they make me smile and my, my cat likes to watch them. So if you're going to attack me for that, whatever. But, <clears throat> well, today there was a video of this cat. Her name's Billy and the owner had a friend over and Billy the cat kept <clears throat> <clears throat> kept referring to the owner's friend as a squirrel. And I asked the Lord about the owner's friend, and the Lord said that the owner's friend was Nephilim. And they kept asking the cat how the cat perceived the owner's friend, and the cat kept saying squirrel instead of human. And I thought it was the funniest thing because the cat knew that that person was Nephilim. Why am I bringing this up? If you're in deep, deep intimacy with the Lord and you are submitted to him and you um, enter into that feedback loop, that process of decide and act, decide and act, decide and act, that takes you deeper and deeper into being holy and being set apart, sanctified, consecrated unto the Lord, he will tell you who to stay away from. He'll even tell you not who not to cross. There's people recently um, that the Lord told me not to cross. For example, the Airbnb that I'm staying in right now, the Lord told me that the guy who owns this place, that he's Nephilim. I could tear this place apart for the amount of money that I paid to be here this week. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, do I have permission to write a review on any platform about this place and he said no and at first I didn't comprehend why I thought okay maybe I might have to come back here later in the future you know whatever and finally the Lord said to me the owner is Nephilim meaning he's inherently evil and if he wants to take revenge or start trouble for me in this area where I'm living where there's a low population he might just do that and so I've learned to trust the Lord whether I comprehend the, the full picture or not, whether I have the, the, the full context or not, when the Lord tells me not to do something, there's a reason for it, and he's protecting me. How do I know this, you know, this, this Nephilim guy, how do I know who he has connections to in this general area? I don't. So if I cross him, how do I know that he's not going to go make things more difficult for me in this general area where I believe the Lord wants me to be, right? So if the Lord tells me not to write a review, I'm not going to write a review, you know. Um, we need to be judging accurately. You need to take the plank out of your own eye. You need to pursue inner healing and deliverance. You need to submit to the Lord. You need to decide to be meek, to be submitted, to be surrendered. So that you have the intimacy of the Lord giving you revelation so that you get to the point where the plank has been taken out of your eye and you can see clearly. You can have clarity. You can judge accurately so that you can be set apart. And part of that is knowing who to avoid, who not to cross, etc. And the Lord will tell you all that. The Lord really can be our everything. And I know I just came on here earlier and talked about how I have these moments where I don't want to go to God. And I was speaking completely, transparently, vulnerably, and just confessing that, yeah, there's moments where my flesh doesn't want to go to God. I think we can all relate to that. But I know, just through my own journey, my own experience, that we very much can go to God. He is genius. There's no one more brilliant than him. He reveals unsearchable things. He knows the future. He knows people's hearts. He knows who's Nephilim, who's not, who's fallen angel people, who's a witch, who's a warlock, who's just, you know, led by their intellect, who's a carnal Christian, etc. He knows everything. So why wouldn't you go to him? Right? So anyway, what I came on here to talk about was just 
epistemology and you know how that relates to being in the tribulation the time of sorrows but the holy spirit has definitely um given me you know con uh, points here to talk about and connections and whatever um but yeah you know there's just this evolution of a, of epistemology that happens when you are in intimacy with the lord when you enter into holiness when you submit and be we be meek excuse me be meek not weak meek um and it may look like weakness to the lord or excuse me not to the lord to the world it may look like weakness to the world it may look like foolishness to the world it may look like um, whatever, laziness, whatever, but that's the thing, Jesus told us, they hated me, and they're gonna hate you, because the kingdom of God was in him, and once you have received his Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is in you, and if you participate actively in that, um, that evolution that takes place with the Holy Spirit, if you participate in that actively, you're going to be constantly evolving with the Lord in your epistemology, in how you see things, because he is going to change your lens. He's going to, you know, again, if you actively participate, the plank in your eye will be removed. And the more and more that you're aware of things, the more and more that you're aware, especially again in the tribulation, that there is a lot of uncertainty regarding the future, but you have to keep your eyes fixed on him. We don't have the power, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are fixed on you, Lord. You evolve into walking by faith instead of by sight. You evolve into this deeper, 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 deeper intimacy with him. Where he will just speak to you. He will just start telling you things. I hope that you have this already. But if you don't, I hope that this has given you an appetite, a hunger, a thirst for this intimate relationship with the Lord. Because that's true Christianity. That's what it means to be a disciple of the Lord. And no, no one's perfect. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. There's no, um, there's no expectation or pressure to be perfect. The Lord, I mean, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of Jesus being our Savior, is that there's grace. But I will say this, that we are in the time of sorrows, we are in the tribulation, and so if you haven't made the decision to enter into that feedback loop of deciding and acting to be meek, to submit and surrender to him, to be participating actively in that process of becoming holy, then you really ought to do that now. I exhort you now in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth to do that now. Start that process now because you're going to need it with what's coming. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, don't condemn yourself for the past, but you can decide right now to enter into submission to the Lord and seek deliverance and inner healing and seek revelation so that you can become holy, set apart, from the world, so that your epistemology evolves, changes, matures, thank you Holy Spirit, so that your epistemology matures, so the plank is taken out of your eye, so that you can judge between the righteous and the wicked in the tribulation, because you're going to need to be able to do that, and you're not going to be able to do that if you don't enter into this process of becoming holy, of having deep intimacy with the Lord. Invite him to change your epistemology, to mature your epistemology. Well, it's been almost an hour. I hope that this was edifying. 
I bless you all in the name of Yeshua the Christ of Nazareth.